guess I'll start. This is me. I work in an EMS company, which I can talk a little bit about what EMS companies are in a little bit, but electronic manufacturing uh, services company. And first thing I'm supposed to say, I didn't write this slide. My sister actually made this slide. She works at the company with me. We're a family business. And uh, so she tries to make fun of me. So she says that you should listen to me because I'm wearing a tie, so I must be smart. But I probably wear a tie once a year. Um, so uh, I went to Oregon State as an engineer. I went uh, for seven years as a civil engineer in the Air Force, but then I came back and started working in the family company. And it's an electronic manufacturing company called Control Tech, and I've been there for 23 years. And uh, we build all kinds of different products for all kinds of people, big companies as well as small companies and startups. So I want to give a little bit of an overview of what the EMS industry is. So uh, it's, it's not emergency medical services, it's electronic manufacturing services. So it really started out in the 1970s where people would bring their parts to companies and have them assembled on circuit boards. Uh, for some companies it's very expensive to have all the equipment and it became a uh, very common thing all throughout the United States. Uh, as we went into surface mount and uh, robotic assembly, uh, it's even more uh, prevalent to go to someone to have your things built if you're trying to get any kind of volume out of them. Uh, the equipment is very expensive. One thing that's interesting, there's over a thousand of these companies in the United States. Just here in the Portland area, I know of probably about 15 of them. And you can uh, be a very, very large company. Most large companies are not in the United States, and they're mostly overseas, such as like Foxconn where they have you know, tens of thousands of employees and do billions of dollars in business. Uh, but in the Portland area, as I mentioned, there's probably over 15 small companies, anywhere from 100 to 100, or one to 150 uh, employees putting together electronics for people. Uh, we're over on the Vancouver side, uh, have about 140 employees, and we, we build all kinds of crazy products. But there's also people that are very, very small. One of our ex-employees started his own business. He purchased an old surface mount machine and actually builds products in his basement. He has his kids help him with the assembly work. So you can go to someone like that, uh, get really good build, uh, build product. And what I'm gonna try to talk a little bit about is how you can leverage uh, and use uh, an EMS company to help you develop your products. Uh, so really in the product life cycle, you start early in design, and we'll talk about how to leverage there, but later on, when you're trying to ramp, if you're really successful, there's a lot of resources out there, uh, and you can use the EMS companies. So I brought a couple examples of things. So one of the things I brought is a little um, module. And this is a fuel controller for a natural gas powered vehicle. So for this, we had a company come to us with an existing design. And they said, hey, can you make this for us? Of course, we look at it. We give them a quote. But when we look at it, we go, boy, this is a terrible design. You know, this is really hard to make. And you have really have some problems here. So for this one, we looked at it and looked at the components they were using. We looked at the environment they're going into. Uh, we also looked at how it actually worked to give them some ideas on how to make it better to survive. And uh, we're able to reduce the cost by about 50% for them. So it was basically we'd seen so many designs over the years, we can uh, know what kind of components to use, where to get those components, and then how to do things a little bit smarter. So to date, we've saved that customer about over $1.4 million just with a few design changes. Additionally, we looked at it for uh, regulatory issues too. So this was an on-vehicle application and uh, there's just a lot of different technical things you need to know about going on vehicles. We'd been doing that for years so it was really, really something easy to do for them. Um, one of the other items that they did is, uh, and I'll have a whole section talking a little bit about this, is that once we build these things, we've got to make sure they work. So you need to have a test for them. And they basically didn't even consider that as part of their uh, process. They make, uh, I can't remember how many thousands of these we've made, but you know, they need to be tested to make sure when they get in the field they're actually going to work. So one of the key things that we look at in early involvement of an EMS company is talking about components. So if you're trying to build some hardware, you've got to find the parts to build it. Uh, if you can't uh, find the components, you're not going to be able to build your product. So that's always a, a fun thing. And I always use an example here that we call unobtainium. And it, it, we've talked about this throughout my career. I've seen it over and over again. We'll get a design in and there'll be a part on there that's never been manufactured, but it's in a catalog somewhere, or uh, it's, uh, you know, an engineer has been able to find it and put it in a design. And this actually happened to me about 10 days ago uh, with a, the, a giant aerospace company in Washington had a design, it had a connector on it that had never been manufactured before, but it was on the design. Uh, so got to go back, redesign, there's a lot of problems with that. 
Uh, one of the big things with electronic components is looking at their availability, which I just mentioned, but then the pricing. And a, a lot of designers do not look at the budget when they do the design. Uh, we've had a lot of people come in with a brand new design, they give it to us, we quote it, and then they go, oh, that's too expensive. We can't meet our marketing budget or it won't support what we need. Then I go, why did you design it? Because the majority of your uh, cost is in your components. So you've got to figure that out early in your design. Don't finish your design without doing your budget to know what you're putting into it. So as you're selecting your components for function, also look for their availability and their pricing. You know, so very, very important. Uh, one of the other things, too, that an EMS company can help with was getting the parts. Uh, a lot of times, once again, we'll get a, a design for someone to build and they give us the bill of material and the Gerber files and get ready to say, go build our circuit board. And we'll go, well, we got to go order the parts. It's a 17-week lead time for this one. Come back in about you know 19 weeks and we'll have your product. And they go, well, I want it next week. And I go, well, we need to take into account uh, component availability and let's start buying the components as you design the product and start buying the components before you get into layout. Let's make sure they're all available. Uh, free tools. I always use the term design from DigiKey, so it's a great vendor out there. It's one of a few others, but make sure the parts are available that you're designing in, and they'll give you the online pricing. Uh, typically, you can get better pricing once you get the volume, but if it's in DigiKey and there's volume in stock and you know what the price is, you're going to do, do well. A real good tool is findchips.com. Uh, there's two levels of tool. There's a free piece of it, and when you put a part into it, it'll look at its pricing and availability, but also to shows you its life cycle. Is it obsolete? How long has it been around? Is the manufacturer planning on continuing to build it for a while? What's the risk rank? Risk rank could be in uh, availability. could also be as uh, looking at counterfeit. Uh, as an EMS company, they'll have higher levels of tools that they can leverage for their customers, so you don't really pay for them. They let you use these tools as part of your, the process to support you. Examples of those are silicon experts. And then most uh, EMS companies are buying components through distribution. We're not buying the components directly from the manufacturers. And those distribution distributors will let you leverage their information to help you with your components, showing you what's in stock, what's a uh, potential cross, um, you know, what, what's the minimum purchase quantity, those types of things. Additionally, when you're working with the supply chain, you want to look at OEM contract pricing. Typically not important if you're going to be fairly low volume, but if you're going to do high volume, you're doing something special, the uh, chip manufacturers or component manufacturers will give you special pricing. They will give you contract pricing that is sometimes 30 or 40 percent below uh, the retail or market price for components. So if you can go ahead and leverage that, that would really help you guys out. Uh, manufacturability. I don't know how many designs we, we get in that have challenges with them, whether something's very difficult to do, it takes special tooling, uh, has different features that caused us to use extra labor, uh, extra machine time, and things like that. So one of the big items here is to leverage your manu EMS uh, company's manufacturing engineers. They literally have seen thousands of designs, and if you get with them early in the design process, they're happy to talk to you, give you ideas, uh, make sure that your design is uh, compliant for the automation of the tools that they use to build things. Uh, they can run design rule checks. Uh, if you got questions on how to do certain things, how to lay out a certain component, is this the right land pattern to use? Uh, what kind of spacing should I use so I can use automated assembly? Those types of things, very, very uh, helpful. Uh, they're also very, very knowledgeable at industry practices and standards. Uh, examples could be uh, familiarity with the IPC standards. If you're designing a special type of circuit board and you need a certain type of base material, they can help you with that. Uh, they can talk about things like uh, uh, circuit board contamination, how to make sure they're clean and useful. Uh, and they can connect you to the PCB vendor uh, who can also give you advice on your design. So if you have questions on how to do stuff, I get a you know, high current circuit and you need a lot of copper on there. What's the max you know, copper I can do on my outer layer? Uh, things like that that are very, very helpful. Um, they can add huge value. And a lot of companies who are now designing product or individuals do not have access to a manufacturing team. So this is a way that you go through your EMS provider to connect you in uh, and tie them into the design reviews. Do not go forward with manufacturing without them looking at it uh, to make sure that it's good, good to go. And once you do that, you'll have better uh, time to market and lower cost. One of the other items we like to talk about is testing. So there's two, sort of two levels of test. One uh, is test of the design when it's complete. And 
uh, that may be engineering tests. So you may go to environmental tests. You're going to hit it with heat. You're going to check humidity. Uh, you're going to maybe do vibration testing, those types of things. Some EMS companies can help you support with that, and they also have access uh, to resources to help you uh, with that testing. For us, uh, we want to look at a design and try to understand the test for manufacturing. So once we build the product, we want to test it to make sure it's working. So you need to look at the considerations for the product. Is it a high volume product? Uh, what market is it going into? What is your budget for testing? Uh, how quickly do you need to have this put in place? And then you do a risk analysis looking at the design of things you need to test uh, to make sure it's going to work. Sort of things we'll look at is we want to have test point access. So I brought in a, uh, a test fixture and it's basically 3D printed. So we use this quite often nowadays. So you'll do a 3D, take your uh, Gerber files, drop them in CAD, uh, build your model, get your test point access that you need. And then this connects into an automated test machine. And the, you can grow these for about $15 in material and anywhere from four to seven hours in the 3D printer. So it's a, an example of building a real quick uh, test fixture to keep the cost down. So, yeah, we'll pass that around. So yes, the circuit board's top. So feel free to pass it around. Be careful; it is a little sharp on the bottom. Has test points. So for this, we're talking about test point access. You notice on here we have a lot of uh, pogo pins accessing in. So we need to have the design considerations to make sure that those are large enough in the design so that we can get the uh, you know, the connection fairly easily and cheaply. You can go very, very fine and very, very accurate, but then you're going to be into machining and you're going to spend a lot of money on your test fixtures. Uh, the other thing we're really looking at is self-test features. So early in the design, uh, you can put features in your design to have the design test itself. So that's a very nice uh, feature if you can add that in. Uh, you can go through and do some test loops, light some LEDs to show things are working, or send information out, say like a UART or an, uh, a data port to send information out. The other thing we need to be considerate uh, for test is how to program devices. So we may have like E squared or flash on board or microcontrollers. So we have to figure out how to program those. And putting features in the circuit design for that is very, very important. Uh, we can pre-program chips before we manufacture, but if you want to uh, program in situ or in the field, you want access for that. Uh, we also talk about boundary scans. So for complex designs, certain chips support the boundary scan protocol. And then you can utilize that for some self-test. But we want to understand that as part of the design before you go forward uh, with finishing your design so we put features in to take advantage of that. Uh, additionally, most designs today, I think we're well over 90% of our designs will have a microcontroller or it'd be some kind of smart design. And we typically like to have connectivity as part of tests. We want to be able to go in, talk to the microcontroller, and then have code to support us to test it. So in parallel with the hardware team, or sometimes maybe the same guy person doing the uh, firmware along with the hardware, we would like to have hooks in the code so we can actually connect in, talk to the device, have it run through tests, you know, check your A to Ds out, loop code, uh, send out, put out, uh, make sure everything's working so it's uh, good to go before we send it out the door. For uh, EMS companies, there's a lot of different test capability that they have. So the first one I passed around is a functional fixture. That's just specifically for a design of a single unit. Uh, we typically interface that with this, the a PC based system below that connects in and then it has uh, a foundation of electronic controls, has power supplies, electronic loads, um, has a scope in it, a waveform generator, a lot of different capability that we're able to then uh, connect to a device under test uh, put current and voltage into it, measure it out, make sure that it's working. It's, uh, we typically use uh, VBNet as a foundation and a PC that drives that system. Uh, we can run through and make sure things work. Things to look at here though, you want to be able to do it quickly. So if you spend a lot of time doing tests, that turns into cost, especially here in the United States where the cost of labor is expensive. So if you spend half an hour doing testing, you probably are going to have you know 20 extra dollars in there uh, for that test time. A good example, we had a customer give us a test fixture and they wanted the uh, test technician to go in and measure about 30 different points and have a piece of paper and write down all the voltages that they're reading as part of their test. Probably took them 20 minutes to do that. So an example of test, we basically put that in a test fixture with pogo pins on those points, uh, have that information automatically read, uh, put into a database and exported to a report. 
uh, meeting the customer requirements, but taking like 30 seconds. So it's very common to do that. Uh, flying probe is another uh, test capability. It's basically a big XY machine that has flying probes on it. Uh, they, I've seen some with update. The one we have has four different probes to fly around. And they basically uh, go down and they engage the circuit board and they measure components and they can actually put current in and make sure things are working. Uh, keys there are to be able to test to allow access. Uh, so if you guys know about circuits or circuit nodes, typically we want to try to be able to access every single circuit node from a single side of the circuit board. So that means in your design you have to put test points in there so we can access them to connect in. Uh, in circuit tests is very similar to flying probe, but rather than using uh, a, a flying probe to go around and touch the circuit boards, there's a fixture that's built for the circuit card. And in the design of that board, this is typically used for very, very high volume or sometimes very complex designs. You have to build a fixture with a bunch of bedded nails in it that the circuit card goes into that connects to a very expensive machine that does all the testing. Uh, I've seen anywhere from seven to $25,000 in costs for those fixtures, so it's very, very expensive. But once again, if you don't design your product right, you can't use that type of testing. Uh, that's typically used in very, very high volume where you want to test a circuit board in just a few seconds and then you know, move it uh, out for the next, uh, the next work. So another thing that EMS companies can help you do is build your prototypes. So there are a couple of companies that uh, focus and specialize <coughs> in uh, rapid uh, quick turn prototypes. Uh, one of them is a local company, really st uh, started the industry of online ordering quick turn circuit assembly services called Screaming Circuses, they're out in Canby, so really great uh, resource. Advanced Assemblies in Colorado, they're very similar to Screaming Circus, very large companies that do that. And then uh, Reliance is down in Corvallis, so it's another local company. And I know people are from all around the country, but uh, you can do this work anywhere in the world and do everything over the internet and have boards delivered in just a couple days. Uh, some of them will actually will buy the parts too and assemble for you. Or you can send them your parts and they'll assemble. As part of that resource, they will give you design feedback on things that are good and what are bad. Uh, you can ask them what's driving the cost. Is it the components? Is it the labor? Um, and uh, they can really help with that. Uh, the other thing is uh, EMS companies have a lot of uh, resources for vendors. So they'll have raw circuit board vendors, PCB vendors that they can utilize. So you can then you know, figure out what your design is needed and what's the best uh, sub-vendor for that. That also works for other uh, resources. So if you're getting into plastics, you're doing metal work, uh, packaging, <clears throat> whatever your product is needs, your EMS company can potentially help you with that. And included with that, uh, EMS companies sometimes do fulfillment. So we have certain customers, we will ship the end product right to the end customer. So our customer never even touches the product, it just goes in a package. So it makes it look like it came from our end customer. Um, <clears throat> What's that? Is that US only? Uh, we have company in Finland we do that for. So, mm -hmm. so mostly US though, very difficult. Once you, then you have to get into, that's another good example of what an EMS company can help you with. So we ship all around the world. So when you ship to other countries, there's logistics issues, there's shipping tariffs, uh, and they can be an expert to help you with that also. So real, the keys to leverage your EMS provider is really early involvement in communication. Uh, don't, wait, don't keep your design a secret. Get out there early, share your bill of materials, show your concept. Do it really, really early in the design phase. What is your budget? Are the parts available? Uh, one of the big things we get into is minimum purchase quantity. So you may design in a chip or a transistor or a capacitor and you, you have to buy it on a 3,000 piece reel. That's a lot of money sometimes. You may have a couple thousand dollars in parts and you may need five of them. Uh, they can leverage the uh, supply chain, the distri distribution to help you get samples of parts uh, for free. So they'll come in and get them for free. Uh, they can leverage their tools to analyze the data uh, and design for the supply chain. Leverage their manufacturer, manufacturing engineering staff to help you with the design, making sure it's manufacturable. If there's any tooling needed, that can be done in parallel to the design. And obviously the design for tests to make sure it works on the, on the back end. That was all I had, but I'm definitely available for questions.
Yeah. So I had a comment and a question. Actually, the first comment is, uh, I hope you don't mind. No. I thought it was really interesting because I, I checked, like you said, you mentioned Foxconn had 10,000 employees. I was like, I think it's more, more than that. More than that, yeah. I just checked online and according to Google, in 2015, they had 1.3 million employees. Oh, wow. Employees. Yeah. Oh, sorry, it's just enormous. Yeah. And, sorry, just comment. And the question was, uh, I, I don't know if there is an answer to this, but uh, I'm curious because if there's like some, I don't think it's a silver bullet, but you talk about ordering from DigiKey, mm -hmm. designing from DigiKey, I think so. And, and for low volume, that makes a lot of sense. But, you know, I'm often wondering, other people ask me, and I've got a little bit of experience, I think you probably know, but I often wonder, can you apply rules of thumb when you look at the DigiKey pricing for, you know, maybe go up to a thousand of them, and you're thinking 10,000 or 100,000. And like for some types of components, you know, I could divide that number by 10. Mm -hmm. And for some, maybe I could only divide it by 1.5 or something. Do you have any rules of thumb about that? Yeah, you're exactly right. So certain components, you're not going to get much cheaper. You know, your R's and C's that are sub pennies anyways. But when you get into specialized components, you can get into very good pricing at high volumes. Typically, you're going to go to the manufacturer. If you're going to really go to that volume, you're going to go to the manufacturer and negotiate with them. And they're going to, you're going to basically get two or three different manufacturers to compete to get you to design in. So we have a, a project engineer that came out of a company in California. And they would actually go to Apple, and then Apple would tell them the price that they needed to hit to be able to get in their design, which was literally, you know, like 10% on the market value of what most people would buy the component for. So, you know, it's and it's really a lot different. So, in the United States, we're building more low to medium volumes. We're not getting in those high volumes where we're able to access that really low pricing. So, I don't know if that's helpful or not. Yeah. So, when you say specialist components, is that is that just context I see? So it could be a connector, so it's right. anything that's usually we follow the dollars basically. So if you've got expensive components, you want to go ahead and be careful with those, and you know try to figure out what you're doing and design in what you can. Uh, if you're a low volume uh, end product, you're probably not going to have much leverage. So you're going to want to try to find something that maybe someone else is using in volume that makes it lower cost, uh, and you can find those. Uh, I didn't mention it, so the. Uh, Distribution and the component manufacturers have FAEs, field application engineers. So they basically are in most geographies, and, and sometimes you have to reach out by phone to get a hold of them. But their job is to support designers to design in their products. So if you've got a chip you want to use, uh, they can answer questions for you. Uh, if you have technical questions, they can get you tools sometimes, they can get you samples. Uh, they can help with those negotiations if you think you want to go high volume and you want better pricing. Uh, so they're a very, very good resource. Other questions? Has, has anyone here used an EMS company? So raise your hand if you're an EMS company. So there's a few. Yeah, there's quite a few in the Portland area. Uh, they're building thousands of products every day. It's quite amazing to see. Uh, so if you've got an idea that's going to leverage and get up to volume, it's good to contact them and, and see what uh, they can do for you. What's that? What are your minimum order companies? We will build like prototype, you know, three to five for customers. But, but you do, like 100 or we'll do hundred. We'll do thousand. So it depends on the complexity, and then it also depends on the labor. So the majority we have three surface mount lines. So those we probably do about eight different jobs on those per day, and the, if it could build like ten or it could build a thousand. Uh, we'll do some smaller circuit boards and the multiple thousands that don't have a lot of uh, labor in them. But then we also build things the size of refrigerators. So, you know, there's, aux there's auxiliary services. So we do weird things like cable assembly is a big thing that we do. Not only, uh, we're probably one of the only EMS that has cable assembly in house, but just like there's a bunch of s people who make circuit boards, there's a ton of people who make cables in the local area. So it's just another resource. It's like a contract manufacturer for cables. Uh, we do conformal coating, so plastic coating boards. We do epoxy encapsulation, so this is an epoxy to go around the electronics to protect them in a rough environment. Um, test services are really big, fulfillment, uh, packaging design. So it's a lot, lot of different things. Do you, do you, I don't think you, um, you mentioned this in your talk, but do you do any kind of engagement with uh, certification houses? Or yeah, very, uh, very often. So we also do design mm -hmm. work, so we'll design product for customers and then design the, do the certifications for them. Uh, we do some certifications in-house, but mostly in the local area there, uh, it's Element has bought up all of the, like Northwest EMC was purchased by them for doing your radio emissions. And then Cascade Tech used to do all the physical, the vibration, the shock, the spray it with water. They also got by Element. So there's test houses in the area and then they will help you go through the certification process. And there's UL and 
ETL, TUV in the local area too. And so that's another thing that you know, EMS companies will likely know the uh, contacts for those companies to help you get the product certified. So, and on product certification, I see this over and over again. People wait till the design is done and then they go try to certify it and they go, oh crap, we've got to redesign it now. So really going to the certification in, uh, agencies early in the design and they can tell you what you need to design to to make sure you're going to pass. Uh, so you really want to do that early in your design. Other questions? Yeah. Monop yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, so also, do you have any, um, do you see any common, commonality in, in components between um, uh, your customers? So do you try and have some, I mean, customers might say, I just need a 10 k resistor, and then it's up to you because you've got the generic one there. But do you, do you like actively encourage customers at any point when early on the design saying, well, if you use one of these components, then sourcing's already done, right? Yeah, we'll, guarantee. we'll do some inventory sharing. So we share across our customers. We have about 120 customers. So we'll share across when we can. Certain customers will dictate you use a certain manufacturer and type of, of components. That makes it a little more challenging. So we try to do that. But uh, usually our customers are sometimes not cooperative. They just, you know, we, we want, you know, if they would design in or use the standard, that would be much uh, easier and cheaper. But sometimes they're not doing that. They just want you to fill their bomb and get going. So uh, big issues uh, up front are use automation where you can. So an, a good example would be uh, if you're doing surface mount on one side say, is cheaper than doing it on two sides of a circuit board. If you have through hole for like your connectors or power components, uh, if you can design it so we can use selective solder, which is robotic soldering as opposed to human soldering, that can save a bunch of time and money. Uh, being able to make sure that the components you select are placeable by machine. Those are some uh, good examples. I think you're really driving your costs more from uh, the components you select than from uh, the manufacturing costs if you follow m normal design procedures or processes. Okay. All right, well, thank you guys very much.